the Bible says they have sown the wind and they shall reap a whirlwind. A phrase completely applicable to the situation in which the world now observes with astonished eyes on the other side of the Atlantic. The USA, the most powerful, the wealthiest country on earth, is in flames. All over that great country, enormous movements of people are taking place, clashes with the police, buildings and cars set on fire. And clearly a mood of burning anger, ferocious anger, uncontrollable anger has taken control of the streets of many American city, cities. The immediate cause of this eruption, this unparalleled whirlwind of revolt, took place, as you know, on the 25th of May in the city of Minneapolis, where a group of uh, four upholders of law and order dressed in police uniforms with badges on, pounced on a man, single individual of color, George Floyd, who was hurled to the ground and pinned to the ground with one of these officers placing a knee on his throat. Now, just imagine one would think, wouldn't one? Four heavily armed police officers with one unarmed man on the ground, prone, helpless, defenseless. What need was there to apply any force whatsoever? Force was lethal force was applied. This uh, thug in uniform, this policeman, held his knee against this defenseless man's throat, throttling him while the man pleaded for his life, saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, I'm going to die. And after eight minutes of agonizing torture, die he did at the hands of these police. Who, incidentally, the most astonishing, the most disgusting thing about this whole scandalous incident was the behavior of the police afterwards. They, they, it, it, it's as if nothing had happened. They filed, a, they, they, they duly filed a report of an alleged offense committed by this person who they had murdered in cold blood. Unfortunately for them, it was witnessed, it was filmed on somebody's uh, phone camera. And of course, these terrible images, these gruesome images went viral. Millions of Americans, millions of people all over the, over the, the world could see how the American police force behave in relation to people like this unfortunate uh, victim, of course. It is well known that he's not the only victim of the terrible police violence which, uh, which exists in the USA. According to the figures which I've seen, just to take one year alone, last year, 2019, I think, if I'm right in, uh, in what I remember, uh, 1,099 cases of people were killed by the police. And the overwhelming majority of these would be, of course, poor people, the members of the underclass, unemployed people. And a high proportion of them, of course, were people of color. A, a far higher pr proportion of people of color are killed by the police every year in the States than, of course, their, their size, rel relative size in the population. This is known. It's been known for many years. It's been known for for decades, and it's like a, a cancer which poisons relations between, of course, the police force and, uh, and the, the people of color and other minorities, Latinos, and so on and so forth. A history of violence, which, which is a blot and a stain on the reputation of America throughout the world. And the worst thing of, 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 all, of all, of course, is the complete impunity with which these people operate, these so-called agents of law and order they operate with complete impunity if i'm not mistaken from the year 2013 to the present date i believe 99 percent yes just just think of that 99 percent of these killings uh, go unpunished 
Yes, there's a, there's, there's a culture, to use that expression, of immunity on the part of these uh, gentlemen, the, the gentlemen in, in blue. Only this time, this murder, which they took so light-mindedly, had the opposite effect. That had, didn't have the same effect at all. This was the tipping point, the straw that broke the camel's back, to use that, uh, that proverb, where the accumulated anger of low-class Americans, ordinarily oppressed Americans, particularly oppressed uh, national, ethnic minorities and so on, exploded. It flowed over onto the streets, it spilled onto the streets. And despite the fact, don't forget, that America, like other countries, is in a state of lockdown because of the coronavirus uh, the pandemic. And the people are not supposed to gather in large groups. They're supposed to stay off the street. Most people would be afraid to, to accumulate in, in large numbers for fear of infection. And here you have all that is it just swept to one side as if it never existed. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people poured onto the streets to express their anger and their rage and their indignation at this monstrous act and all the other monstrous injustices which people have to suffer in silence in American society. This is quite, quite, quite extraordinary. It's extraordinary if you, if you th look at the, the images on your television screens. These, these are quite uh, unprecedented, I believe. I believe in, in recent American history, I can't think of a single example. In many cases, it's completely unprecedented. And what is interesting is that they were, of course, immediately met with ferocious repression from the, from the state. You see, of course, you get all these people in the press complaining about violence. That's the latest thing. It's violence. It's violence. Oh, yes, yeah, sure, these people might have a case in relation to George Floyd. But, I mean, look at all the violence and the burnings and the, the arson and the, the vandalism and so on. Look at the violence. Yes, look at the violence of the mob. That's the way they put it. Yeah, don't look at the violence of the police, of course. Don't look at the violence of the uh, of the National Guard, who reacted with with a ferocious offensive against these protesters. Most of whom were, were protesting peacefully, by the way, but of course they were met with what? With rubber bullets and with uh, tear gas and with savage beatings. They were battened, beaten to the ground, shot at. In some cases, killed. I don't know how many people at least. At least two or three people have been killed, to my certain knowledge, as of, as of today. Yes, but the interesting thing is this: all this repression did not work. It didn't have any effect. And these thousands and thousands of people, by the way, black and white. Look at the images on your TV screens. That's very interesting. Not just uh, black people, people of color, and so on. No. A mixture of black and white and all kinds of people who were, who were frankly fed up with, with the present unjust criminal regime that exists in the United States took to the streets. In Minneapolis, for example, that's ex extraordinary. I don't know whether it's not, maybe not the first time in history, but it can't be a very usual event, where the police were forced onto the defense they had to run, they had to retreat in the face of this barrage of uh, this enormous onslaught of, of, of protest. So much so that they had to abandon the central precinct, whereupon the, the demonstrators, obviously moved by a, a colossal feeling of anger against the police, they burnt the building down. I think that must be a first. I can't think of any, even, even at the height of the civil rights movement, which I can remember in the 1960s, I don't remember any situation where the protesters burnt down a, a major police station in an important city like uh, Minneapolis. And this must have sh shaken the authorities who were clearly unprepared for this enormous uh, outburst of indignation and, and, and anger. They were thrown on the, onto the defensive. First of all, they reacted, the Minneapolis authorities were compelled immediately, naturally, to sack the four policemen. Yes, but that's just a joke, isn't it? Not even a slap on the wrist. Here, cold-blooded murder is being carried out, not by, not by one person, but by four policemen, because the other three clearly participated in this act of murder, cold-blooded murder, of a defenseless man. Just to sack them from their jobs is completely insufficient. 
Subsequently, they've uh, uh, reacted a bit late in the day by arresting the main culprit, the man who, uh, who actually perpetrated the murder in front of people uh, on, on, on the screens and so on and so forth. But, but even that's, that did not serve to quell the movement. The movement, of course, first of all, they wanted all, all four of these cops, quite rightly so, to be arrested. If anyone else had done a murder like that, which would have been witnessed by billions, you or I or anybody else would have, been, would have been behind bars, of course, before you could say Donald Trump. Yes, but that has not, not yet happened. But even so, even I will predict, even if they do, and they probably will take action against these people to save their, to try and try, in a desperate attempt to stop the movement. I don't think they'll succeed. I'm sure they will not succeed. And the reason that they have not succeeded is an astonishing thing. Look, 40 cities, no less, at least more than 40 cities, on the latest count, have been uh, put under curfew. This is a serious matter. You come out of your house uh, when, when, when a city's in curfew and <clears throat> very unpleasant things can happen. You can be shot or arrested. It hasn't worked. The masses heroically have defied the, the, the curfew. They've still come out. And this is the sixth night. Now, now it's the sixth night in a row that these mass protests have continued all over America, not just in Minneapolis in Los Angeles, in Atlanta, in New York, even in Washington. I'll come to that in a moment. That's an interesting state of affairs. This enormous movement, is, which is quite courageous, by the way, facing all these terrible, uh, this terrible repression, which I've mentioned, still continues. And still they mourn about violence and so on and so forth. I'll come to the question of violence in a moment. Let, let's just, let's just uh, deal with this question of violence. You see, the state itself, Lenin explained state is, in its last analysis, the state is armed bodies of men in defense of private property. I'll put it a bit differently. The state, whether it's in America or Britain or anyone else, is precisely organized violence. That's what it is. They have a monopoly of it. That's the point. They want to have a monopoly, the, the rich, the bankers, the people who really run society in America and elsewhere. They demand a monopoly of, of violence. Nobody else is supposed to, to, to do anything. Yeah, it's a little bit like, let's say that you're attacked in the street by an armed uh, criminal. Okay, you're armed with a gun or a sort, sort of shotgun or a, a chainsaw or whatever, and you pick up an axe or, or, or a stick and you try, you beat him in order to defend yourself. Are we going to put violence, this kind of violence, on the same level? Is the violence of the aggressor to be put on the same level as the violence of the person who acts in self-defense? Because this is a mass movement of people, of oppressed people that have said enough. We are tired of having our people murdered with impunity and so on. We are tired of this oppression. And they're acting, yes, of course, in self-defense. That's what it boils on. It's pointless criticizing and complaining and mourning. I don't agree with this. We cannot condemn people who rise up in defense of the in self-defense, in effect, in defense of their rights against terrible oppression. What we do and will uh, condemn is, of course, the organized violence of the state, headed, of course, by our friend uh, Donald Trump. And how did he uh, he react? He react? He reacted in a predictable manner by pouring petrol on the flames, naturally. He issued a tweet, I think it was on the 29th of, of May, he issued one of his celebrated tweets, which ended uh, very typically, I thought, with uh, the winged fr phrase, when the looting st uh, starts, the shooting starts. Now, come on, my friends, what is that? If that is not an open, blatant uh, call to violence, incitement to, to violence, incitement to the police to open fire and the National Guard to open fire on demonstrators, then I don't know what, what, what it is. It's true, subsequently, it seems that uh, even, even Donald got, uh, must have got told off, or got had second thoughts, and he tried to justify it. Oh, no, I didn't really mean to say that they should shoot. You bet your bottom dollar that that's precisely what he meant. And even Twitter, not known for their progressive views, even the bosses of Twitter were forced to take action for once to curb Donald Twitt's uh, Twitter. He wasn't very happy about that. But nevertheless, here's a man inciting the president of the United States, inciting to murder. Of course, he's entitled, absolutely. The president is entitled to incite to murder. 
and the police are in, 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 entitled to commit murder. That's the message. You better get this straight. But when the people try to defend themselves, well, of course, that's not. That's violence, and that must uh, must must stop. Now, incidentally, the, this movement went so far that it, it it got to the Capitol, to New York, and to the White House. Oh yes, I think these unprecedented scenes you see it on your television of angry protesters on the lawn of the White House, practically almost brushing aside the guards, the, the armed guards, armed to the teeth outside, setting fire to neighboring buildings and cars and so on and so forth, and shouting out demands for justice and so on, which could be heard clearly inside the White House, which must have caused panic. It did cause panic. This great president, the hero of the, the, the Twitter board, you know, such a courageous man calling on people to be shot in cold blood. Yes, he fled. Oh, yes. Just an astonishing. The president of the United States of America was compelled to flee to an underground bunker, a secure room with his family, with his wife and his son, at least, I don't know, maybe other members of the family also. And he stayed there for almost an hour, cowering. Yeah, the president, the almighty president of the United States, cowering in a cellar. As the because his security officials were afraid that the, the, the demonstrators, the masses, if you like, might penetrate the, the outer defenses of the White House. Yes, this is an astonishing state of it. I don't think I, I know a little bit about American history. I can't think of a, a single example like that. The USA has been through all kinds of experiences revolutions, civil wars, you name it First World War, Second World War, the Great Depression. Never, never in your life have you seen a scene of an American president being forced to flee for his life, basically, in an underground bunker. And this, really speaking, is, is quite interesting. Because th this movement, incidentally, it's a movement that's gone far beyond now. It's no longer a case of George Flynn, George, uh, the, the, the murder that was killed, but the chap that was killed. Not a case of the chap that was killed. It's, a, it's an expression of an, uh, of an outrage, of an anger that is built up for a long time for all kinds of injustices of all sorts, all kinds of injustices. And therefore it's, it's, it's burst out. And it's directed, of course, against the government, against Trump, naturally, he was a, a hated figure, quite uh, justifiably, quite correctly so. But you see, if you analyze it a little bit closer, there's a chorus has gone up now against violence. That this violence has gone far enough. It must even the so-called friends of the people, the so-called friends of the protesters. Now so suddenly they, they change the tune. They say, "No, no, no! It, it, it's enough now, girls and boys. Go home." Now, see, they, they're pleading. There's some woman. I don't know who she was pleading. It's enough now. Uh, no more violence. Violence must end. Go home. Go to your houses and so on. End this end this madness and so on. Yes, of course. And people answer on the streets quite rightly. They say, look, we have been protesting for years and decades and nothing is done, nothing changes. It's only by taking direct action as we are doing that it seems that people begin to listen, begin to take notice. I think, uh, I think they have a point, don't you? I think they certainly do have a point. But you see, what's interesting here is that the ruling class has got different means of controlling uh, society, of preserving its, its rule. One is direct violence, yes, the state, they've got the army, the police, the, the army's been, the, rather the police has been sent in, the National Guard has been sent in, and now, believe it or not, there are plans in the Pentagon to send the troops into Minneapolis. It's been openly discussed. This is, again, unprecedented. And it shows growing alarm on the part of the ruling class. Oh, yes. And you know, there's another, there's another method whereby they can maintain control. Not by violence, but by other means. Oh, yeah, there are other means. You know, there are two parties in the States. It's really one party. As, uh, as Gore Vidal once said, our party, our republic, has a, one party, the property party, with two right wings. I think that's a fair description of the Democrats and Republicans. But the difference is that the Republicans, Donald Trump in particular, are open, naked expressions of reaction 
of organized violence against the working class and the poor people and the blacks and the Latins and so on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but there's another wing, a slyer wing, a more cunning wing, a cleverer wing in many respects that uses different methods. For example, they appeal to the people, they appeal to these angry people demonstrating on the streets, risking their lives on the streets, facing death on the streets. They hear these, these siren voices from no doubt well-meaning people, preachers, pacifists, above all Democrats and leaders of the Democrat party. Oh yes, oh yes, it's all very well, you've made your point. Now, you've made your point, now go home please. Stop the demonstrations, go home. Calm down, calm things down. That's what they wanted. They all wanted to do this. Even I think even the Republican establishment has got alarmed, and it seems that they were considering the possibility that the president should make a speech to calm things down. The only problem was they realized very quickly that if Donald Trump was to make a speech about these things, he would undoubtedly not calm anybody down, but hot things up. He would throw petrol on the flames again, as he habitually uh, does. In fact, Donald Trump did, if I might make a point, he did have a, a so-called press conference this morning, if I'm not mistaken, on the lawn of the White House, I think. The assembled journalists were there, and they were naturally expecting the president to speak about the crisis, the terrible crisis that America is in. Where cities are being burned out, 130 cities at least are in the throes of this tre tremendous violence, you know, are going up in flames. <laughs> America is going up in flames. And a bit like the Emperor Nero playing his fiddle, what has uh, Donald J. Trump got to say about all this? Precisely nothing. He got all the journalists together. He talked about his problems with China, the trade war with China, or above all, of course, his, uh, his war with the uh, World Health Organization, which he's going to cut off the money and so on. And then, as they all waited with bated breath for him to say something, and then, and then, he did the vanishing act. He he fled. He fled the scene without saying a single word. The the, the journalists were so astonished that some of them grabbed the microphone and they started to shout out, "Hey, Mr. President, what's happening with this crisis?" And not not a single word, of course. Subsequently, subsequently however, he did uh, issue more tweet, tweets. I think uh, today. He issued more tweets on the same line that we're too soft on these demonstrators, these protesters. You've got to clamp down. You've got to get the situation under control. Further incitement to violence to crush, crush the living daylights out of the movement. And we will see what the result of that is going to be. But I, I'm referring to the other wing. Yes, the Democrats, what do they say? Well, they use the same the usual weasel words, you know. Oh, we must have peace and tranquility and brotherhood and motherhood and apple pie and all the rest of it. You know, that's what they, they say. And the president ought to be unifying the nation, etc., etc. Joe Biden is a specialist in this kind of nonsensical talk. Peace when, when the whole of America is in flames. Brotherhood and friendship when the whole country has never been divided as it is now, except maybe for the Civil War. The only example I can think of. Absolute nonsense. And of course, bear in mind just one interesting point, one, one point I would like to make. Trump says, get off the streets or I'll send in the, the army. You, you'll be shot. The Democrats say, get off the streets because we want to talk and, and so on and so on. Both of them agree on one thing, get off the streets. That's the one overriding concern of the ruling class and its political representatives of both sides, get the people off the streets, get them to go home. And what is the soothing little lullaby that the Democrats sing, same as always? Be patient. Be patient, people. Be patient, guys. All this will be resolved very simply if you only wait. Wait for what? Oh, wait for the elections. Wait for the elections, please. In June, is it? In November? I don't know. Wait for the elections. Vote for Joe Biden and everything will be solved. You know, the trouble is that this song, this lullaby is no longer, no longer, no longer serves to soothe the, the nerves of, any, of anybody. You know, people are tired of this talk. The patients, the masses have got a lot of patience, but you know, sooner or later the patience wears thin, it wears out. 
And the patience of the people of the United States now is worn out completely. That is the real meaning of the present situation. People are fed up with this talk. And as for patience and go home and say, yeah, go home and do what? Go home and vegetate in a state of absolute and complete impotence. And that's the, the reality. Oh, yeah, cast your vote for Joe Biden. Yes. You know, the thought will have occurred to many people. Look, we have voted in elections many times. What has changed? What's changed in America? What's changed in this new opposition? Absolutely nothing has changed. And that, my friend, is a fact. No, what is required here is something a bit deeper. What's, what's required here is not an election in which the choice is, what a choice between uh, Donald Trump on the one hand and Joe Biden on the other hand. I mean, that's not much of a choice, my friends, is it very much? People can be excused for coming to that conclusion. No, what people are, 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 are doing, the people are learning, you see. The masses learn more in 24 hours of direct action, revolutionary action, because that's what it is, because this is this is really a, a popular uprising. It's an insurrection in all but name. People learn, people draw conclusions, and they draw many conclusions. For example, the idea of reforming the police. Well, this, this police cannot be reformed. No, no, no. And this state cannot be reformed, and this system can, and this regime cannot be reformed. No, what is required here is a root and branch change in society. The word that I'm looking for is revolution. By the way, the Americans already had one revolution in the past, two actually, because the Civil War really was also a kind of revolution. A, a new revolution is necessary, absolutely necessary in the United States. Well, that's the only way that you can get a change. And in a sense, you know, I've been very critical of Donald Trump as you all are, but let's 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 be a little bit charitable. You know, in a sense, we should be grateful for Donald Trump. Oh yes, why? Because he's taught the masses in the states a few lessons. Even in the last few days, he's teaching them quite a few lessons, which will not be quickly forgotten. You see, there are two ways you can learn about the nature of the capitalist state. One is by uh, reading Marx and Lenin and. Uh, listening to podcasts of this uh, sort, hopefully. Yeah, but that that's, can reach a certain number of people, a growing number of people, I might add, are interested in, in the ideas of Marxism as put forward by the international Marxist tendency. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but that's a small minority. A far quicker and more effective way of learning is by having your head cracked by a police baton, being gassed by tear gas, being run over by a police car and being shot at and maybe wounded or killed by uh, an armed representative of the state. That's a lesson to the nature of the state, to the mass of people. And therefore, you see, the young man that called out, there was a young man in the demonstration, he called out, young black man, I think he called out, we are at war. This is a war, he shouted, among the, the general tumult. You know something, comrades and friends, that's very true. We are in a war, oh yes. Not just in America, but in Britain and everywhere else, but uh, particularly now in America. You see, our, our friends in Europe who had doubts about the USA, they better think again, as we've pointed out many times. Oh, no, no, no. The prospect of a revolution in the USA has not gone away, it's very present. And by God, when it does, it does it take place, you better look out. The whole world will shake once that takes place. Now, let's be clear. Is the present event a revolution? Well, no, it isn't. It is a, a very important uh, episode, a very important episode, in which millions of people will be drawn one way, one way or another will be drawn into action. Even if they're not personally active, they'll be following it closely and drawing conclusions. Yes, of course. Very advanced conclusions, I would say. Furthermore, that's the most important thing. You know, Lenin used to say, for the masses, an ounce of practice is worth a ton of theory. And of course, he was a very great theoretician, I hasten to add. Yeah, but it's experience. The masses learn in all countries. The masses don't learn from, from books. They learn from experience, particularly experience of events like this. This is a national uprising, yes, but this is a war. 
And a war consists of many battles. What we now have in America is just one more battle. It's an important battle, this is the beginning. It's the opening shots, I'll put it that way. Oh yes, we are witnessing the opening shots of the American Revolution, my friend, neither, neither more nor less. And I stand by that statement. Although some of you might not agree, but, they, but uh, you'd be wrong. These are the opening shots of the American Revolution. And you better take note of this because America is the key country in the world when all is said and, uh, and done. Yes, but a war consists of many battles. The present battle, of course, will not last forever. It cannot last forever. The uh, protesters, of course, are very courageous and very persistent, and they've succeeded in carrying out this campaign uh, to the present time. They, may they will continue a little bit longer. But ultimately, they're faced with a ferocious, a, a formidable obstacle, obstacle, this monster, which is the bourgeois state power. All the, all the, um, the, um, the accumulated uh, physical force of the army, the police, the secret police, the CIA, all the rest of it. Yeah. A formidable obstacle. Yeah, sure. And therefore, this, this uh, present movement, that's what Trump and his cronies are banking on, and they, they probably right to bank on it. The present movement will not continue for them. It will die down. Yes, but that is Trump's big mistake. That's the big mistake of all the capitalists. Uh, strategists. I am firmly convinced, I got not the slightest doubt. Something is changing in America, my friends. No, let me correct that statement. Something has changed in the United States of America. A big change is taking place as a result of the accumulated experience of years and decades of frustration, of unemployment, of, uh, of uh, suffering of all sorts of oppression, of exploitation. And people, frankly, are beginning to reach the conclusion enough is enough. See, one of the things that really must alarm the, the, the capitalists when they look at the, the last few days, when the masses begin to lose their fear, that's dangerous. And it seems to me very much from the events in Minneapolis, for example, that uh, the repression, ferocious as it is, it hasn't had the, the same effect of cowing people as it, as it did in the past. That's very dangerous for the ruling class. That's probably why they call the Democrats in to try to uh, try to delay the process and clear up the mess to some extent. We, we shall see. At all events, it will die down eventually, yes. But I'll tell you one thing. Nothing will ever be the same again in the United States of America. No. Everything has changed now. Everything has changed. The genie is out of the bottle and it will not easily be put back into the bottle. No matter, no matter what they've done, no, no matter what they do. No matter who wins the election, whether it's uh, Biden or Trump, doesn't make much difference as far as I am concerned, because they represent the same class and fundamentally the same interest. But people, people are changing and people are drawing conclusions, very advanced conclusions, by the way. This is one battle. There'll be many other battles, I tell you, more, more bigger battles than this. Yes, we face this formidable power. Yes, we do. It's a fact. And you could be excused, a superficial observer who doesn't understand Marxism might draw the conclusion, many people do. Oh no, it's impossible. How can we defeat this monster? How can we overthrow a powerful state? Yes, it's very powerful. It's the most powerful state on earth. Yes, so was Russian Tsarism, the most powerful state on earth. So was the state of, uh, of Louis the 16th in France, the most powerful state. Oh yes, they were overthrown. By, the, by a power which is greater than the state. Now, let me spell this out. I'll finish on this note. And if you forget everything else that I've said in the course of the last half hour, please don't forget this. You know, there is a power in society, in this world, which is stronger than the most powerful state, the biggest army, the most ferocious police force or secret police and so on and so forth. That colossal power is the colossal power of the working class, our class. And we're the majority, you know. We are many, they are few, get that idea into your heads. The enormous colossal power of the working class, once it is organized, mobilized, and led into a struggle for the conquest of power. Yes, how, how do I say this? Why do I say this? Well, it's very simple. Think about it. Think of the colossal power that's in our hands. 
Not a light bulb shines. Not a wheel turns. Not a telephone rings without the kind permission of our class, the working class. That, is, that my friends, is a colossal power. And once that is set into motion, then, of course, the whole situation, the, the whole equation changes. Incidentally, I notice symptoms, no one to exaggerate, but there are significant symptoms, even in the present uh, situation. I note cases where bus drivers, for example, in Minneapolis and also in New York, have refused to drive buses full of policemen that were going to move against the protesters or move arrested people and so on and so forth. Small things, yeah, yeah, small things, small gestures. Yes, but highly significant gestures. Just think, if the same attitude were taken by the trade union leaders, if the same policy was adopted by the trade unions in the States entirely, the situation would be entirely different. And that's the future. That movement will come. As I say, my friends, and I'll finish on this note, never forget this, the words of Shelley, the great English revolutionary poet. We are many, they are few. And just to finish on one marvelous uh, quote from the French Revolution, that great, great, great historic movement in, in, in human history, a poem, which was like an agitational slogan. They only seem so mighty in our eyes because we kneel before them. Let us rise. <laughs>